Alexa off. Tim and we're live. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to this meeting of the Local Government Pension uh, Scheme Board. Um, I remind uh, members that uh, if you wish to speak during an item, please use the raise your hand function uh, within uh, the teams. And at the end of uh, each item, uh, you'll be asked to uh, indicate whether you're for, against or abstain, uh, again, using the chat. And we will have a break of at least 15 minutes uh, every two hours. Hopefully there won't be that many uh, lots of two hours during the meeting, but uh, we'll make sure we have appropriate breaks. So I'd like to welcome Brian Kane, who's new to the board and has been appointed as the employer rep substitute representing the district and borough council. So welcome, Brian. Uh, we welcome back James Kidd. Uh, James stepped down as the uh, employer standing sub for the police at the March meeting, uh, but reapplied and was appointed this time as the employer rep for the police. So welcome, James. We welcome back Tim. Uh, Tim Perkins. Tim, Tim stepped down after the March meeting at the end of his four year term as a member standing substitute, uh, reapplied and was appointed, but this time as a full member rep. Uh, James Hurley, uh, we welcome back. Previously served on the board as an employer rep, but having retired, retired has reapplied and been appointed as a member standing sub. And we also welcome Sharon Moore, who has been appointed as the other member standing sub on the board. Welcome, Sharon. Uh, Monica Patel uh, has been a member rep for the board for three years. Uh, see you there, Monica, uh, and is stepping down uh, after this meeting. So we thank Monica for your service to the board. Thank you, Monica. For the benefit of uh, our mass audience out there, uh, I'd like to ask uh, members to uh, introduce themselves uh, to uh, the meeting, um, start and, and saying what your position is on the board, starting with the employer reps uh, with Jolian. Good morning, I'm Jolian Adam. I'm the employer rep for the schools and academies. Sarah. Good morning, I'm Sarah Ansell. I'm an employer representative um, from the University of Hertfordshire. Thank you. Adam? Uh, I'm Adam Mitchell, County Councillor in Stevenage, and I'm the Vice Chairman on the employer side. And James Kidd? Hi there, I'm James Kidd. I'm the employer representative from Hertfordshire Constabulary. Right. The uh, employer standing subs, uh, Terry? Terry Hone. Yes, Councillor Terry Hone from uh, Letchworth South. I am a substitute for the uh, uh, employer representative for uh, Adam when he's uh, too busy to come along, which is not very often, I'm pleased to say. Thank you. OK, Rob, Rob McCarthy. Yeah, I'm Rob McCarthy, um, standing employer substitute member. Uh, I'm also chairman of the Hertfordshire Association of Parish and Town Councils. Thank okay. you, Chair. Brian, Brian Kane. Hello, I'm Brian Kane, employer rep for the uh, District Stroke Borough Councils in Hearts. And member reps, Gail. Hello, I'm Gail Johnson. I'm a retired accountant, therefore a pensioner member representative. OK, Monica, Monica Patel. Hi, I'm uh, Monica Patel. I'm a member rep. I'm also um, a HTC employee as a solicitor. Uh, Tim. Tim Perkins, uh, past Chief Officer and Clerk to Abbots Langley Parish Council, joyfully retired last October, so now a uh, member retired rep. And the member standing subs, James Hurley. Uh, you're on mute, James. Not too good to start that. Good morning, James Hurley, member representative and uh, substitute. Uh, I'm a former director of resources and CFO with the police uh, and also worked uh, for police pensions on a range of national issues. OK, and uh, Sharon Moore. Hi, I'm Sharon. I'm a deferred member, having been a former employee of the University of Hertfordshire. Uh, I suppose I should introduce myself. Uh, I'm Mike Collier. I'm a uh, retired member. Uh, formerly employed by the County Council and the um, Hertfordshire Police and Crime Commissioner, and I'm the chairman of this group. Um, 
Right. I now have to ask any members to declare any financial or pecuniary interest related to specific matters on the agenda. I seem to have none. Actually, one thing I will just do, it's not on my order of business, but could I uh, invite officers that are uh, attending to um, just introduce themselves and explain their role? So uh, I'm going to leave you to yourselves on this one because I don't have a full list of who the officers are. Patrick, you're in the middle of my screen at the moment, so I'll start with you. Uh, good morning, everyone, and especially to new members. My name is Patrick Terry. I'm head of pensions for the Hertfordshire Pension Scheme. We must have some other officers yep. here. There. Good morning, all. I'm Phil Prasad. I'm the principal accountant for the Hertfordshire Pension Fund. Um, I'm introduced myself again, Brian Kane, and I'm an HR advisor for Watford Borough Council, stroke through a shared services arrangement with Three Rivers District Council. Goodbye. That's all the officers, Mike. It's uh, oh, me and all. Phil today, and one <laughs> consultant. You might want to invite the consultant. Yes. Uh, is he That's, present at the moment? Yes. yes yeah. Sandy. Yeah. Good morning, all. Uh, Sandy Dixon. I'm from Mercer, who are the investment consultant to the pension scheme. And yeah, welcome to all the new members. OK, thank you very much, everybody. Right. First item of business is the uh, minutes of the last meeting, uh, which um, was held on the 11th of, it says 11th of December on my order of business. I think it's 11th of March, was it not? Yes, uh, the uh, pension board meeting on the 11th of March. Um, has everybody had a chance to see these? Um, can I ask you to use the chat function to uh, confirm whether you are happy uh, with these um, minutes? So if you just say agreed in the chat function, if you are so minded. OK, that item is agreed. So we then go on to item two uh, on your papers, uh, which I'll ask Patrick to uh, introduce. This is the Pension Board Business Plan for 2022-23. Patrick. Thank you, Chairman. Um, for the benefit of new members, this is quite, and for your first meeting as well, this is quite an appropriate paper to put in front of you it as it actually sets out the business plan for the fund for the next 12 months. Um, it also provides members with some background to some of the key strategies that and policies that underpin the um, delivery of the work for the fund. And uh, you'll see in section 2.3 some of the principal activities that will be uh, undertaken over the next 12 months. The main ones being the triennial valuation of the fund, which is every three years the fund is valued. Um, we look at all the assets and liabilities for the whole fund generally, but also all the employers and uh, set contribution rates. So this is a, a massive uh, piece of work. Uh, we'll be working closely with our actuary and some of the members on the board have actually received some training on um, the valuation and the process in setting assumptions. Um, we'll also be reviewing, uh, which we we do generally um, on a cyclical basis, the key fund policies that underpin uh, the fund's activities. And some of those policies will be updated to reflect uh, current uh, regulatory changes, but also um, will be refreshed as part of the valuation process as well. Uh, members of the board will be familiar with um, the uh, our partner, the LPPO, delivers the administering service for the fund. Um, they are implementing a new system under a project called Project Place. This is another key activity, and we are working closely with LPPA to ensure that all the data that's been uh, migrated from the old uh, legacy systems to the new system um, are um, correct and are, are fit for purpose. And um, we've been satisfied to date that um, the reconciliations and the data migration has been successful. Um, you'll also see there on um, under 2.3, we'll be looking at our communication strategy with the aim to implement a new and uh, separate website for the fund, which will enable us to um, um, provide 
a lot more information about the fund activities, our investments, um, some of the work that we'll be doing on responsible investment um, and also um, some of the policies that members may be interested in, and also third parties who um, um, on a regular basis contact the fund for information about our activities with respect to investments and responsible investment. You'll see there the investment strategy review. That's another um, review that we are required to undertake legally every three years. We um, are constantly looking at our investment strategy and we'll tweak it. We don't wait for the three years to undertake this activity, but we will um, do a um, root and branch review of the strategy um, as part, uh, alongside the valuation process. Um, responsible investment, the separate papers on the agenda that talk about this. And then we are also transitioning our custody arrangements and the custody is um, it's a bit like the bank. It holds all the records of all the um, uh, assets that we have with all the various investment managers. It undertakes the reconciliation of all the uh, transactions that we do, sales and purchases, all the managers do on our behalf and provides us with um, accounting records so that we can comp complete our financial year end accounts. And then um, access, that's a separate paper on the um, on the agenda. I'll go into a bit more detail there and a review of the equity protection strategy. So that is the main items of the business that will be delivering throughout the year. Um, it's uh, and Appendix A sets out the meetings where we propose to deliver papers to provide updates on progress on these items. It's not set in stone that Appendix A. Some of those um, papers may be moved to um, latter uh, meetings or there'll be um, additional papers that we are required to bring because of um, work um, that um, is maybe regulatory requirements to um, do certain work with the fund that we need to provide board and committee updates on. Section four provides members um, with some background to the fund and the governance of the fund. Uh, I won't go into too much detail there. It's quite interesting reading for, uh, that's, that's my perspective, but for new members of the board, um, I'd encourage you to read that. And uh, it, it gives you some uh, detail as to how the fund is run and the responsibilities of the committee and the two boards that support the local government pension scheme and the fire board. Section five, um, we have a um, we don't deliver administration of the fund um, for the payment of benefits, uh, pensions, essentially, and collection of contributions internally. We outsource this to a partner called the LPPA and section five provides details of um, the budget contribution that we are required to make to the LPPA. This was approved by the Pensions Committee at their meeting recently. Um, there has been an increase and um, that increase is of um, just under 140,000. It's reflective of a number of factors. Um, some of it is to do with um, the migration to the new system and the need to bring in additional staff to support that migration on a temporary basis. Inflationary pressures as well, they are um, subject to um, providing uh, paying salary increases, but also suppliers and um, that um, inflationary in pressure is, is there. Um, it's offset slightly by a 4.2 reduction in non-staff costs and that is um, essentially around the replacement system. Um, which is a fully integrated system. The old system was um, a number of bespoke systems that essentially weren't talking to each other. So we'll deliver some savings there. The long term um, objective is to reduce this budget contribution. And we've been in quite a lot of uh, conversations with the LPPA around this and uh, looking at their forward strategic plan and how they're going to um, cut those costs. Section six uh, provides members with, again, the key strategies. Again, for new members of the board, I would encourage you to look at these uh, documents. They are useful background information that explains um, um, why these policies are in place and uh, the, the, what activities they relate to in the fund. Section seven is uh, just about the forward plan in Appendix A. So um, I would actually also like to talk on the knowledge development, which is um, Appendix B. All members of the board are required to um, have um, do some learning 
and some of that learning will be done, uh, will be supported by officers through um, MS team sessions. We'll put in hourly sessions throughout the year and uh, we'll actually also um, ask you to join committee so we can do the shared learning together with you. But some of this is also a requirement of board members to do some self learning. Uh, we have a um, uh, our actuaries developed a learning tool called Lola, which is an online tool. And for new members, I will um, ask um, our committee clerk to get your email addresses and we'll, we'll get you set up on um, that system. So you can <clears throat> look at these modules, which refers to all the various sections, uh, modules that are referred to in Appendix B. Uh, and they're useful. They give you some um, additional detail and uh, you can look at these and um, learn at your leisure. Um, but I would encourage you to do this. We'll be bringing a report to the July meeting, which sets out um, the learning that we've delivered to um, members of the board and committee over the last 12 months, the tools that are available to you for additional learning, um, and um, we'll um, be recording the use of Lola as well, a uh, number of members who are actually accessing Lola and the uptake of that, because that's a key tool for us to support the learning development of uh, members of both board and committee. Happy to take any questions, Chairman, on this particular report. Thank you, Patrick. If anyone has any questions, if you could use the uh, the hands up uh, function. Uh, I see a hand up there from Jolian and then Gail. Thanks, Chair. I, th I think Gail was first, but I'm sure she won't mind. Oh, <laughs> right, right. Um, just a quick one, because uh, it sort of relates to the business plan a little bit. We're all familiar with the asset pooling that's been going on for a number of years. There was sort of rumours a while ago about administration pooling. Out of interest, is that anywhere on the horizon in terms of government direction or is it kind of died away a bit? Um, I, I haven't heard any rumours on the rumour mill. Uh, we have quite a lot of close contacts with um, the uh, offices and um, civil servants in central government through the both the scheme advisory board and through some of my colleagues in access. We haven't heard anything about this pooling of administration services, but I wouldn't rule it out. Um, we are expecting a, a raft of uh, regulatory changes with regard to the LGPS and, and pooling generally in the summer, but I think it will be more focused on the investment side than the, than the administration side, Jodian. Okay, thanks. I have Gail, then I have James Hurley. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, one comment and one question, if I might. Um, the comment is just to echo uh, Patrick's recommendations uh, to uh, access the online learning because I find it really very useful. And indeed, if anyone has got more time, the pension regulators uh, trustees toolkit has a public sector scheme module as well, which uh, was, I don't think it was around when I started on this particular board and if it had been I'd have found it very useful so there's just that bit of extra information and um, the question is just about the um, costs in the new budget um, I know in the past we've felt possibly that the cost per member uh, might be lower than other organizations but we understood why um, are we now benchmarking and seeing that the uh, costs that we're paying now are pretty much um, standard yeah, we we will be uh, before we joined the partnership last year. We did a, we undertook a number of benchmarking exercises, looking at where our costs were compared to um, other funds. And as you uh, quite correctly said, we were well below the benchmark. We are on that benchmark now. We are paying about twenty odd pounds per head. Um, we would expect that to fall with the uh, LPPA. Um, cost cutting exercises that they'll in, in, introduce once the new system is embedded. And we expect that we will either be on par or below um, par for the um, cost per head for funds across the LGPS. Thank you. Thank you, James. Yes, uh, I see the uh, triannual funding strategy is on the work plan uh, for, for the coming year. Uh, will that um be where issues uh, concerning potential additional employer costs um relating to issues such as mcleod and treasury cost sharing and any tribunal uh, judgments would get addressed and, and uh 
is there a need to uh, have some specific training or awareness just built into the, the calendar on those issues? So in respect of um, McLeod, Goodwin, um, the various different um, scheme changes that we are required to implement, they are being taken account of through the valuation. Um, we are waiting for regulations to come out, um, particularly around McLeod. We're expecting them later this year. But the uh, actuaries have made allowances for this within the valuation. Um, we have delivered um, papers to boarding committee on McLeod. We expect once the regulations come out, we will do some further um, papers on, on this particular item. But uh, in answer to your initial question, yes, yeah, being captured within um, the uh, valuation as an assumption, then the actuary will make an allowance for McLeod and Goodwin. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Um, I'm not seeing any, so I'll move to the recommendations. There are, there are two recommendations on this item. Uh, 3.1, that we note the content of the report and comment on whether they wish to see any further items on the forward agenda. I am taking from that conversation there are no additional uh, items, unless anyone corrects me now. And the second one is that we... Uh, it says we comment on the budget. I think we'd note and comment on. I think we have commented uh, the budget contribution of two point eight five million pounds. Um, there were two items. Can I ask you to uh, respond using the chat function? Either agreed both, uh, agreed one, <laughs> abstain the other, agreed one, uh, reject the other, uh, as appropriate, please. Thank you. Okay, the, that is uh, agreed and noted. Item three, which is the asset rebalancing review. Um, I have a note that it's uh, Philip and Sandy. So Philip, are you gonna start this and then hand over to Sandy? That's me, Mike, uh, sorry, Chairman. Oh, sorry. It's Patrick, it's Patrick. Uh, we'll introduce it. Oh, right, you, okay. And then I'll hand over to Sandy to go okay. through the detail. Um, just for, a lot of members of the board, this will be a, a new item for you. But um, to give you some background, the Pensions Committee back in 2018 agreed that um, each year we would look at the strategic asset allocation of the investment assets within the fund and rebalance them to bring them back within their strategic asset allocation. Um, we, we've set some uh, target parameters um, whereby um, we allow growth and uh, depreciation in those assets. But if those um, assets, such for example, global equities were to grow above those um, target ranges, then we would um, re make recommendations to rebalance and um, reduce that um, allocation to say gro global equities and uh, move some of those assets to um, a strategic asset class that was um, under their uh, weighting. So um, that the purpose of the paper is would be normally to make some recommendations uh, to the committee to address um, these um, overba overbalanced asset classes or underbalanced. However, and I'll let Sandy go into the detail, the first part of this first quarter of this calendar year, there's been a number of geopolitical events that have caused equity markets in particular, but markets across all set asset classes, commodities, uh, bonds to um, be um, cause a great deal of volatility. And so what we've agreed is to postpone the rebalancing until markets stabilise. But I'll let Sandy go into um, some more detail on that. Yes, Sandy. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Chair. And good morning again, everybody. Yeah, just so just to reiterate what one of the, the main decisions the committee makes is the investment strategy. And this is clearly a lot of time and effort is taken to devise a long term investment strategy. 
for the fund to ensure that it's meeting the return objectives that the Act resets as part of triennial valuation. And that investment strategy then has target allocations to various asset classes. So given that a lot of time um, is, is spent on this and really that the risk and return is pretty much driven by these decisions, it's very important that the assets then invest in line with the investment strategy, which is why uh, every year we come back to committee and report on where the actual assets have invested after market movements compared to their long term investment strategy. Um, the committee has previously obviously looked at this every year. They've taken the steps to rebalance back towards their strategic benchmark. I think this has been really beneficial actually to the fund over the long term, rebalancing out of sort of managers that have done very well. It's quite a hard decision to make because clearly there's an emotional attachment. You don't want to disinvest in something that's done really well for yourself. But it's very important because sometimes these things happen. They do very well for a period that may be unperformed. So this rebalancing is a very important process. As Patrick mentioned, with rebalancing, we're, we're sort of driving by looking through the, the rearview mirror of the car. The assets here are that 31st of December. Clearly, everyone is well aware of the tragic events that have occurred in Ukraine. That's had significant impact on, on valuations for equities and bonds and other assets, as, as Patrick mentioned. When this paper was taken to committee, clearly there was a lot of volatility in the market, mainly caused by the geopolitical events. Um, and so the decision was to pause. Let's not rebalance at this particular time. Let's wait until there is a bit more stability in the market so we can be confident of what our assets actually are when we do the rebalancing. And so at the next committee will be taking a paper based on, I think, 31st of May um, asset values. And if there's stability in the market, then rebalancing uh, will proceed. One thing I would touch on, if you see on the paper on, on page 32, you will note the fund was as at the 31st of December, quite significantly overweight to global equities. Clearly, this is one of the riskier areas of the fund. Uh, and so naturally, in times of potential market stress, you'd probably want to be reducing that. Now, one decision the committee took a year or so ago was to introduce a uh, almost an insurance policy around these equities, which then dampens the sort of volatility. So when you have these unfortunate extreme market events where where global equities fall, this insurance policy almost kicks in and helps protect uh, the value of the assets, which hopefully then stabilises the funding level, uh, meaning that we maintain enough assets to pay our, our pensioners. Um, so uh, that's everything I was really going to say on rebalancing. This will be again addressed by my committee in this, I suppose, is papers for noting from the board. And more than happy to answer any questions anyone has. Sorry, sorry about that. Uh, right, okay. Any questions, anybody? To raise your hand in the usual way. I'm not seeing. Uh, Gail, is your hand raised? It is. Yes, it is, Chair. Thank you. Yes. Um, could I just come back to what you've just said, Sandy, which was about the insurance policy? Is that the equity protection strategy that the paper refers to? Could you just spell it out a little bit more? I don't think I've got all the details <laughs> to hand. Well, so, I mean, the fund in aggregate probably has about close to three billion pounds invested in various equities across the globe, UK and globally. So this strategy basically almost puts caps and collars. Uh, so you, you basically buy insurance. So if at markets fall, you then get a payout. So that's your buying insurance on the low side. So that's protects us from the falls, but clearly that has a cost. And so what the fund does is they kind of sell, sells a bit of upside. So basically what we're doing is rather than having equities, which could go up a lot or could fall a lot, we basically say, well, we don't need, we're pretty much 100% funded now as a fund. We don't need these really extreme positive returns, but we really don't want is these extreme negative returns. Mm -hmm. So we basically kind of cut uh, the range of outcomes from our equities by selling that upside to buy the protection on the downside. And that's in, in a nutshell is, is how the insurance, you kind of buy the, the insurance uh, to protect from falls by selling some sort of upside insurance, for want of a better term, on the upside. And therefore you sort of reduce the volatility of markets. And so that really did work over, over February time when unfortunately we saw you know, the, the tragic events unfold and equities fought, fell significantly, the protection then started to kick in. And so the funding level and the assets of, of the fund were, were sort of stabilised in that manner. We can't protect all falls and we do need to take some risk to maintain that sort of upside to make sure that over the long term, the fund remains affordable and can meet pensioners, uh, pension sort of obligations. Uh, 
but this mechanism sort of ho hopefully reduces that volatility, reduces that risk, and, and hopefully means that members and committee members, board members can sleep easy at night, knowing that in extreme events that the fund's well insulated and protected. Yes, it can't, it can't be presumably open-ended. I mean, everybody will want that sort of protection now that it must come to the point where it's so expensive to buy, it's, it's not worth it. Yes, yeah, so obviously this has been in place for a while. Um, as, as, as you rightly say, sort of over February time, the protection we had in place was then worth a lot more, which helped yeah. protect so that. And this is obviously it's on a on a rolling basis, and it's as Patrick alluded to, the, the committee will be looking at this again um, as part of the investor strategy review. I think we've got the term is is sort of three years, so about one year into it. Um, mm -hmm. But I mean, this is this is an asset. So if markets fell significantly, this is an asset that would rise in value, and you could sell it if you wanted it to, to sort of bank those gains. So it's, it's not a set and forget. This is constantly on, on the agenda of committee and um, we, we sort of speak to officers regularly about it and how it's performing. Um, and yeah, we will it's certainly constantly under review. Thank you. Thank you. Patrick, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I just wanted to add that um, we are running some training sessions for committee members in May, um, two sessions on this particular subject matter, and we will invite board members to those sessions so you can get a better understanding of um, how this equity protection strategy works. Uh, I think it's key that if we're presenting papers to you that uh, you have some um, uh, background knowledge on how it's been set up and uh, what it actually does. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions or comments? Not seeing any, so I'll move to the recommendation that we note uh, and comment on the content of the report using the chat in the usual way, please. Okay, that has been duly noted. We move on then to item four, uh, which is the access update. Patrick. Thank you, Chairman. Um, this is uh, for new members of the board. This is a quarterly paper we bring to both board and committee, which provides an update on asset pooling that we are, we are part of a pool called Access with 10 other local authority pension funds. The aims of pooling are to deliver through economies of scale, reduced investment costs and allow opportunities for smaller funds to get access to certain asset classes they wouldn't be able to do um, on their own because of their scale. Um, section four uh, of the report provides some background to members of new members of the board of what access is and um, how it the governments and how it operates and um, it's a regulated activity um, we um, contract with a provider called link who um, run the sub funds for the access pool section five of the report um, explains how sub funds are established 26 sub funds have been established to date um, there is assets in in those um, sub funds of uh, 23 billion with an additional um, 12 billion under what we call access government for passive funds and passive funds are funds that track indexes and uh, the nature of these funds um, are that they are entered into under what is called life policies and they can't be run by link and so we contract separately as each each fund contracts separately with the provider who is UPS. Um, however, um, decisions around um, UBS changing them or um, going through procurement processes uh, take place under the access governance. Um, in um, section five, I also refer to some of the work that we've just been just started working to establish a liquid funds. A liquid funds are funds that um, don't have um, readily available market pricing, um, trade it and can't be traded daily. So these are things like property assets, private equity, um, infrastructure and uh, private debt. Um, so we've started work recently on um, launching, trying to launch our first sub fund, which will be a property fund that will take um, some 
about 12 months, I would suspect we have to go through a procurement process to provide a property manager who will run the, the fund for us. And uh, the Hertfordshire Fund will uh, initially make new commitments into that fund and over time transition legacy assets, its legacy property assets into that pool, um, dependent on whether um, our current manager, CBRE, is um, one of those managers who's appointed to that uh, particular um, pool sub fund. Section five um, sets out, table three in particular, sets out the sort of forecast savings that we've been delivering uh, or anticipate to deliver over this year from pooling. Um, section six sets out on pages 42 to 43 of your pack, sets out the proposed budget. So we, as a member of the access pool, are required to make a budget contribution to the um, access budget for 2022-23. And you'll see that um, the budget this year, we are um, making a slight uh, increase in our budget contribution of about, I think it was about a 12,000 pound. And then 6.2 on page 43 show, sets out some of the main business activities that will be conducted by the access pool. Um, my officers and I, we contribute to these work, the work delivered through access. There is an access support unit, which has a director, but fund officers are quite uh, proactive in um, managing a lot of the work streams that underpin the business plan for access. Section seven, I want to pay, spend a bit, little bit of time on this, and this is um, re in respect of governance and um, the access governance, um, the decision making body is a joint committee made up of 11 chairmen, uh, chairmen um, that represent each of the 11 funds in access. They are all elected members. Um, the Scheme Advisory Board, which is a body that advises central government um, on um, local government pension scheme, has um, advised, provided guidance um, to all the pools. There is about eight pools out there with respect to governance and what they would like to see on their decision making um, structures. So they would like to see board members um, sitting on those structures, um, either in a decision making capacity or having um, some form of um, observer status. The access pool to date does not has invited observers, but only to part one of those meetings. Um, there was discussion with the uh, Section 151 officers and for those um, board members who are unfamiliar with what a Section 151 officer is, this is um, the chief financial officer of the local authority and the 11 access funds chief financial officers um, met um, um, recently and uh, supported a recommendation to address the Scheme Advisory Board's concern that um, observers are allowed to attend both part one and part two of the Access Joint Committee meetings. And you'll see that in um, the um, section 7, 7.1, 7.3. Uh, to allow all boards to be able to participate in this, and it's it's um, it's quite key that we uh, initially have a um, allow all the boards uh, to send representatives to the um, access joint committee. We've set out a proposed meeting structure and rotation, and that's set out in Table Five. This will be reviewed after twelve months because um, some of the um, members of the joint committee um, felt that this may not give the continuity of um, attendance and um, the uh, opportunity for members of board members to develop their knowledge. So I suspect this will be reviewed in 12 months, but to address and allow opportunities for boards to attend initially, this is what's proposed. I would also add that the expectation is one of the board members that, uh, for example, we're at, um, if you look at uh, the meeting structure here, we've got meeting B, um, Hertfordshire is expected to send two observers to that meeting, that one of those board members is a member that represents the membership. So that's deferred <coughs> pensioner and uh, active members, and the other member is um, an employer rep. I expect this um, the Hertfordshire attendance to be at the meeting on the uh, 12th of September, 
once I get the details, I will um, come back to the chair and the vice chair um, with, to confirm that date and then invite um, attendees um, to represent the Hertfordshire board. Section eight of the report um, shows the Hertfordshire position in respect of what assets are in the pool and outside the pool. Hertfordshire's got about 49% of its assets in the pool. Um, you'll see that they are primarily in um, equity and bond funds. We have had a higher percentage in this pool. We've had about 60-65%. Um, that's been reduced over the last 12 months. Um, one of the decisions um, that um, um, led to the reduction was a disinvestment from a manager. That was a point that we appointed about 12 months, 12 to 16 months ago, um, a manager called Longview. Um, we, uh, the pensions committee, made a decision to disinvest from them and withdraw the money from the pool because the manager wasn't doing what we initially um, appointed them to do. So we have made an application to access to get a replacement manager and we expect that money to flow back into the pool. The other disinvestment was from our UBS manager, uh, from our bonds. We have uh, quite a high, we did have quite a high allocation to gilts. Um, we disinvested um, some of those gilts to fund some of our property um, investments um, with um, M&G and legal in general. That's that uh, the second column from the bottom, property, um, PR, private rental sector and high lease value. And also we disinvested some assets to fund infrastructure debt investments as well. And um, th those disinvestments took place over the last two years. Um, we also disinvested some gilts to and equities from UBS to act as collateral for our equity protection strategy. Mm -hmm. So that's an explanation of why um, there's been a fall in the assets in the access, access pool. There are going to be inflows back into the pool and that is set out in the paper. We expect to um, move. Uh, we, we have made an investment of 375 million in a manager called Dodge and Cox, which is a global equity value manager that's set out in 5.7. We will be moving our bond manager Blue Bay into the access pool that was approved by um, the joint committee at its last meeting. So that's an, nearly another 300 million moving in. And we've got some emerging markets um, managers that we are waiting to be um, um, approved by the FCA, which will involve £300 million worth of assets moving into the pool as well. Um, Section 9 provides uh, some an update on the responsible investment policy that access as a pool is developing. Um, you'll see some papers on the rest of this agenda around the RI policy that will be de developing for the fund. The pool is required to have an RI policy. We I suspect that um, there will be subtle differences between um, some of the fund's RI policies and the pool policy. But uh, just to uh, provide you some background, the RI policy for the Hertfordshire Fund, we have we have sovereignty over that. And so if we don't find that the access pool is providing us with some funds, sub funds that can address our RI requirements, then we'll either make applications to access to put those in place or keep those funds outside the pool. Chairman, that's all I was going to say on this paper and happy to take questions. OK, uh, Julian, I uh, saw so your hand up first and then Adam. I didn't actually have my hand up yet, but I do have a question. Oh, so I do, I <laughs> psychic, <laughs> psychic link. Um, I think I'd um, looking at the uh, proposal about having local pension board members going along to the access committee, I think I'd probably echo that concern. I think you said was raised whether that was by our committee or the joint committee itself, that the schedule set up looks a little bit half of your members will be going to maybe one in four meetings and I'm not quite sure how often they meet so maybe it's once a year or something I know they're termed observers at this stage so it's probably just to see how it works but hard to see how they could make a, a meaningful input given that there would just be a dip in I'm sure the access committee is looking at quite a lot of kind of again complex issues if you said like a meeting like this you were just coming in for one one meeting a year you wouldn't really have that continuity of stuff so I'd probably share that that concern, but I appreciate it's kind of a trial period and then another potential run will be taken at how that how that's administered. So it was comment more than anything else. 
Thank you, Gillian. Adam. Yeah, thank you. So I'm, I'm looking at the savings table in 5.5. Uh, which seems to have sort of plateaued a little bit um, and that might be because we've taken some of the things out outside of the pool but as as we put more into the pool Patrick would you expect those savings to increase going forward? Um, it would depend on the style of manager if you're playing um, if you're swapping like for like I you're moving your manager uh, and I'll give an example Blue Bay we are paying more fees outside the pool but by moving it into the pool with um, two other funds, uh, Cambridge and Northamptonshire, we will um, we will be able to negotiate a lower fee with that manager. However, if we're moving from, say, a growth manager to a different style of uh, equity manager, for example, a quality manager, we may expect there may be a change in fees. So it's like you can't compare apples and pears. Um, what we're trying to do in this table is compare where we're moving like for like um, and you'll see in part two um, in the cost of investment management paper how our fund compares to uh, peers when um, when we look at our investment management costs. OK, thank you. And also I, I'd share the thoughts about going to the occasional access meeting. I, I think really if you're, good, if, if you're going to be useful, you, you're going to need to go to several meetings. Uh, I, I share those thoughts as well. Thank you. And yet on that last comment and Jolian's comment as well, it was um, the chairman of the Hertfordshire Fund that raised that concern. And that's why um, they asked, he asked for a review period to be put in after 12 months. That's good to hear. Thank you. Uh, James Hurley. Yes, um, uh, just sort of um, looking at the previous paper and the rebalancing and then also the investment strategy work. Um, is there a tension between having to manage uh, the pooled and the unpooled um, and transitioning uh, legacy investment whilst adapting to the new rebalancing and investment strategy sort of constraints? Um, generally, I would say no. Um, I think with respect to rebalancing, you're looking to move assets between your current asset um, man between your current managers within the, the fund. Um, I think the, the, st the stresses, uh, tensions could come where we're doing fundamental investment strategy changes. Where for, let's use an example, um, we wanted to invest in green renewables, a manager who is um, um, concentrated in renewables and the access fund doesn't have that and our strategy says, yeah, that's what we want. So what would happen there is we'd probably procure that manager outside the pool and then ask or uh, invite access to accept an application for us for that manager to go into the pool. OK, thank you. Any other questions or comments? No, OK, well, in that case, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, I move that uh, we note and comment on the content of this report. Can you uh, agree or note otherwise in the uh, comments, please? Chuck function. Item four voting noted and commented on, Chair. Thank you. OK, we move on then to item five, uh, Responsible Investment Project Work Plan. Uh, Patrick. Thank you, Chairman. Um, again, I'll um, lead on this and then <coughs> hand over to Sandy for some comments, as this is a joint piece of work. Um, we felt that it was really important. We we. We set out earlier a business plan for the fund, but we also felt it was really important to pull together a work plan for how we're going to deliver this um, responsible investment project. Um, most members of the board will be aware that the 
the fund has got an investment strategy, but also we do have what is called a uh, ESG policy as part of that. Excuse me, I've got to turn on the battery in the back of my laptop. Um, and we do have an ESGRI policy, which we frequently review. And um, we look to, as part of the review of the investment strategy and the RI policy, we look at the asset allocations as well to capture regulatory changes and decisions made by the committee in respect of stewardship and governance of the fund assets. The fund has always adopted today a policy of engagement with companies uh, through its investment managers as opposed to disinvestment. We believe that, and the committee has been um, quite um, strong in its conviction that it believes that stewardship can, and engagement can influence company chain, company behaviour. And we've seen that, and in particular with some of the changes to um, low low carbon econ economy, some of these companies putting in transition plans on how they're going to reach targets that they've set. And um, our investment managers have been, and we met one of them recently, Bailey Gifford, who set out how they engage with companies and challenge them in respect of their transition plans. Um, but I, this this um, actual um, work plan does not solely focus on um, low carbon economy and transition plans, but it also looks at the um, societal impacts of our investments. Um, we look at also um, the governance of the companies that we're invested in. And it's quite clear that it's important that companies are well governed um, because that um, gives investors confidence um, in their business plans and uh, the way those companies are managed. So that will be part of our review as well. The fund's current policy um, has, um, it, I would say is pretty light in detail and we've been challenged by external parties on this um, but I don't think it reflects some of the work that both the committee and board or the committee and a working group of members have done in the past on implementing um, things like carbon footprint reporting in investment in a climate aware fund and so some of the work that we'll be doing through this work plan will be building upon those um, activities that we're, we've already got in place. Um, you'll see that uh, there is a number of work streams and we've broken it down into five work streams. I think um, if I go work streams one to four, these are the initial building blocks and work stream five is the implementation plan, looking at the reallocation of um, assets um, once we've uh, agreed the, the policy and um, some of the modelling that's been done. So Workstream 1, which um, is on your agenda, is the beliefs and RI policy, um, the belief survey which all members um, of committee and board are invited to participate in. We'll share the results of that with you in part two. But the objective of that work stream, part one, is to establish some belief statements that uh, the committee and board support and from that develop an RI policy and there's some training that will be delivered over the next two months on that particular subject matter as well. Work stream two is climate change scenario analysis on investments and building transition plan and interim and uh, long term targets to um, comply with um, Paris Accord. And the objective of this work stream analysis will be to inform further work in setting measurable targets for reducing emissions carbon reduction and that transition plan. Um, Workstream 3 is more about a regulatory requirement um, and I'll be clear here the LGPS um, or this fund is not required to comply with this at the moment. A lot of private sector funds are that um, have a um, and these are um, usually the um, large private sector funds with assets under management over two billion plus. Um, this is providing climate related financial disclosures and uh, the objective of this work stream will be to meet the requirements of TCFD. Um, the fund, um, although not required at the moment to um, do this, we feel that at some point we will um, under regulations be required to do so. So we want to get ahead of the curve on this one. We do some of this already um, and we've been delivering reports on our carbon emissions and intensity to both committee and board since September 2019. Workstream 4 is the stewardship code and uh, the ambition of the fund is to be a signatory to the stewardship code. 
This will require the filing of a draft report to the Financial Reporting Council. Um, and um, again, it, it, it's quite an intensive piece of work and we'll be working closely with the um, our consultants um, developing this report. And finally, as I said, Workstreams 1 to 4 lead nicely to Workstream 5, which is the implementation and the um, looking at um, strategy options for the implementation of the requirements um, that have been agreed through Workstreams 1 to 4. I was going to hand over to Sandy um, if he um, would want to run through his appendix. Thank you, Patrick. Good chair. Uh, and just to sort of reiterate what Patrick said, especially both for the new members of the board, ESG, and apologies, there's lots of acronyms in here, environmental, social and governance considerations, as well as RI, so response investment. These have been integrated for a number of years, but by the fund when they select managers, and it's been very important for the committee that these considerations, because they can have a financial impact, have been taken into account by managers. So I would hopefully the board will be reassured that the fund's been doing this for quite a while. I think part of this exercise is to make sure that we have policies, processes and reports in place so that we can always make sure that the that members are aware of the work the committee and the board have done over the number of years. Um, so I mean previously uh, work so the, the managers that, that the fund have all have very high sort of ESG uh, ratings uh, that we, we provide. Uh, as Patrick said, there's been carbon footprint analysis, so the committee is well aware of where the fund stands compared to just invested passively um, on, on its, uh, the potential impact that carbon pricing, et cetera, could have. And so the, the part of these work streams just to make sure we can codify these a bit more and make sure we have good transparent reporting lines back. Um, and as sort of Patrick alluded to, we, we might say there's these five work streams. In reality, they, they all sort of have impacts on each other and they're not individual silos. Clearly the beliefs in the RI policy will feed quite a lot into the investment strategy to make sure the investment strategy picks that up. The climate scenario analysis, again, this is thinking how will the assets react in various scenarios depending on what happens um, with, with climate change and what that might have on our assets. Clearly that then again feeds back into the investment strategy to make sure that assets are invested in an appropriate manner. Um, and then obviously three and, and four particularly probably more about external reporting um, and especially just to touch on stewardship code before I stop is all the underlying managers that we invest in uh, are signed up to stewardship code. There is a report that we take annually um, to committee which uh, looks at this and asks managers uh, for their stewardship code reports. So now the, the idea or the purpose is because under uh, ISS so investment strategy statement guidance there is an indication that funds should sign up to the stewardship code as well and so that is what this report is, is going to do so hopefully sign up to that report which clearly there'll be a lot of leaning on managers and access as the pool um, because obviously they are the one that actually implement a lot of these things uh, on, on the fund's behalf. Okay thank you Philip Sandy. Any questions or comments? Uh, yeah Tim and then Jolian. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Just a quick question really for Patrick. Um, in a previous meeting, you mentioned that you were having, um, how shall I put it, sort of angry from Bishop Stortford getting in contact saying how dare the pension fund invest in BAT or Shell or anything like that. Is that still a feature of um, your day to day email responses or has that sort of died off a bit? Um, Tim, that's a good question and we were getting a lot of challenges for a quite considerable period of time. I think it has died off. Um, I've got to admit I can't recollect the last time I had um, an FOI or um, or one of um, the chairman or vice chairman has had an email from um, a third party um, to, urging us to disinvest from certain asset classes. And I think a lot of that is to do with and what we've been doing is signposting them to some of the reporting that we've been doing. And uh, we've had a number of discussions with some of these groups as well to explain what we're doing in the background. The challenge from them to us has been you're not transparent about this. And so this work plan that we have put in front of the committee and board is trying to highlight that and provide that transparency. Um, we're not saying that we're going to make um, um, and you know, big decisions about disinvestments from certain sectors that will um, that will fall through, will come through um, this uh, process that we go through now. Um, I think uh, the committee's view today on engagement has been the correct one. 
and uh, and I've seen the evidence that these companies have been listening to their shareholders. And I think that's very important that you're better off engaging with them and having active share ownership than sitting outside and uh, um, trying to pressurise them without any active voice in, in, in that discussion. OK, excellent. Thank you, Patrick. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, probably a question for Sandy. Hi, Sandy. Um, and uh, Patrick maybe sort of hinted a bit of an answer to this one. But in terms of um, equity investments, we've obviously got about half of the equities. It's like about 1.6 billion with UBS as, as passive um, management. Um, how do some of the ESG principles get applied to that kind of mandate? Because I can kind of understand it in an active management. Bailey Gifford say they engage with the companies they're looking to apply investments to and, and talk about ESG. But and I know within UBS there's there's various sub funds and some of those might be a climate aware one. But in the broader context, passive is probably where we're going to have exposure to the, you know, the Shell, the BP, things like that. Is it just uh, um, we've got some shares, therefore we've got some votes and, and try and sort of steer the ship that way? Or is, is there anything else that gets built into that? Um, to try and kind of reflect those ESG ambitions. Yeah, thanks, Shane. It's an excellent question. Um, and you're, you're quite right. Clearly, when we're choosing active managers, we want to understand when they're choosing companies to invest in, how do they integrate environmental, social, and governance considerations when they're choosing those companies? Clearly, they're trying to pick the best companies they think are outperform and add value to the fund. Clearly, passive, you're quite right. It's very different. What they're trying to do is provide you with a market return by investing in all listed companies. Now, that does mean that you will have exposure through passive to tobacco companies, to oil and gas companies and the like. And you're quite right there. The ESG piece is probably more on the governance side. And if you think these passive funds, so UBS, Elgin, BlackRock, they hold combined, they have you know trillions of pounds worth of assets. And so these are major shareholders on all these boards. So with that comes quite a lot of power really if you're a major shareholder and you're voting and trying to inform the board and the management of a company this is the direction of travel otherwise we'll vote against you that is how they can influence it and that's why we always have this policy of engagement because as a major shareholder when you invest passively you almost have to hold these companies as you sort of say it's then about right well if we own this company we have a say in the direction of travel of it and so we can hopefully and that's why you know UBS are aligned with sort of RI policies of the fund, we can then move, hopefully move in the, in the same direction. Um, so that's that's the idea behind that. The Climate Aware Fund, uh, just to touch on that, that will deviate slightly, so they will have under and overweights on various um, companies. They're still trying to um, achieve market returns, so track the market, so provide passive returns. They have a bit more bandwidth than the classic passive manager. We're allowed a little bit more deviation away from the market, and they will say, go, well, Exxon, we've tried to engage with them. They're not really as responsive. We will be underweight them, and we're therefore they might be overweight. Maybe someone like Total, uh, you know, a French company that's investing a lot in renewable energies, um, so they can maintain sort of sector alignment, but really try and move the dial slightly towards the companies that are doing more than others. Okay. That makes sense. Thank you. Thank you for that. Any other questions or comments? I'm not seeing any, so I'll move to the recommendation that the pension board notes and comments on the contents of the appendix and the responsible investment work plan. Can you respond through chat in the normal way, please? Okay, that has been noted and agreed by all. Um, dates of future meetings then, just before we uh, close part one of this meeting, we've got the 14th of July, the 11th of October, the 9th of December, the 17th of March and the 11th of July. Um, we've had no other uh, part one business, so um, I therefore move the recommendation that 
Under Section 100A4 of the Local Government Act 1972, the press and public be excluded from the meeting for the following items of business on the grounds that they involve the likely disclosure of exempt information relating to the financial or business affairs of the particular person, including the council, as defined in paragraph three of part one of schedule 12A to the said act, and the public interest in maintaining the exemption outweighs the public interest in disclosing the information.